The Bengal Chamber, in association with the sponsors for the day, GIS Group, The Telegraph, who are our media partners, Bandhan Bank, GS Marketing Associates, Anderson Printing, and Perno Ricard India, is delighted and humbled to have you all in our midst. Humbled indeed, and uh, simultaneously relieved. Because, you know, we were absolutely inundated with phone calls, with messages between my colleagues and me. We have probably handled close to a thousand, uh, you know, phone calls and messages just to, you know, have this program organized. Everybody wanted to be here. Everybody who's part of the extended Bengal Chamber family wanted to be here to hear the extraordinary personality whom we have in our midst this morning. We have um, had presidents, prime ministers, um, actors, sports persons, even beauty, beauty queens uh, gracing Bengal Chamber. But compared to the interest and the excitement that, you know, that this morning has generated, uh, it's unparalleled. A friend of mine um, has, uh, we were discussing this program yesterday, and a friend of mine was referring to Dr. Tharoor as being inimitable. So may I now request you to please put your hands together and welcome the man who has honored and privileged us with his august presence, the one and only, the inimitable Dr. Shashi Tharoor. We uh, don't have the temerity to introduce him to you, but uh, for someone who has been publishing articles from a very young age, who did his PhD at the age of 22, who is an award-winning author, India's foremost expert on international relations, a diplomat, a global icon, and a speaker and custodian of India's economics, politics, human rights, and culture at the global platform. We're indeed indebted that he could spare some time to be with us this morning. Dr. Tharoor will be addressing us uh, on New India, a narrative, India in the 21st century. In this context, I cannot help but recall the words of uh, Mr. Kokon Mukherjee, uh, my boss, uh, years back. And in fact, uh, he was a man who shaped the current secretariat uh, that we have in the Bengal Chamber. Uh, Mr. Mukherjee is, is a person who also introduced Dr. Tharoor uh, to us, to the Bengal Chamber. You had addressed us uh, to, in 2009 uh, in, uh, in an healthcare conclave, sir. Um, in fact, uh, Mr. Mukherjee, in one of his speeches, and I think it's very contextual, so I'll, I'll quote him. He spoke about two Indias. He said, and I'm, I'm quoting him, one India is training at the leash, eager to spring forth and live up to all the accolades that the world has been showering recently upon us. The other India is the leash. One India says, give me a chance and I shall prove myself. The other India lurks in the skepticism of our minds. One India wants, the other India hopes. One India leads, the other India follows. But conversions are on the rise. With each passing day, more and more people from the other India have been coming over to this side. And quietly, while the world is not looking, a pulsating, dynamic new India is emerging. We're eager to hear Dr. Tharoor on our new India. May I now request Mr. Debe Mukherjee, Vice President of the Bengal Chamber, to please formally commence this session and take forward as a moderator of the rest of the morning. Thank you. A very good morning to all of you. Certainly, the impactful power of the narrative is being felt by all of us like never before in recent times. I would have felt a little nervous if the subject for today's uh, lecture series would have been just a new India, a narrative because that would have reminded me of the deliberations of the debate at Calcutta Club last evening, and where I thought it was a new India equal 2014. 
But I'm happy that we have an India in the 21st century added to it. I compliment the Secretariat and Dr. Tharoor's office to have made the subject a little more comprehensive and a little more expansive, shall we say. In the history of a nation, a defining point when an old order changes and a new order takes over is very difficult to determine and often we find that through major disruptions that change happens. Are we at that point? I'm sure Dr. Tharoor will regale us, will give us his perspective. But the interesting thing is, what we would like to know from him is how does he see the journey from where we are not hankering back into the past. As he said yesterday, we often go to the ancient past, not the immediate past, but where we are and where he sees us going forward. Shubhadeep has already introduced Dr. Shashi Tharoor. He needs no introduction, but certainly a, a role model, I would say. I mean, a politician, a diplomat, an administrator, uh, uh, a, a very erudite scholar, but above all a charming personality with a brilliant mind and a razor sharp wit. More of that from Dr. Thar Shashi Tharoor and his narrative on a new India but in the context of 21st century. Over to you Shashi. Thank you very much, Dave Mukherjee and uh, Shubhadeep Ghosh for those very kind introductory words. And great to see so many of you showing up here on a Sunday morning to fill the hall. I, I had indeed spoken uh, for the Bengal Chamber some years ago, but you're right, it was not in this venue. It was an off-campus venue on a, on a healthcare conference uh, that you'd organized. So I was just looking at these bewigged and black-suited and black-bow-tied eminences who presumably were the previous presidents were they, the, of the Bengal Chamber. And it's a welcome reminder of how far we have come from the not-so-new India <laughs> that, uh, that surrounds us today. Uh, but it's, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I, I want to say that uh, I'm slightly taken aback by, by both the introductions because, unfortunately, um, the topic that got conveyed to me through my staff was only about New India, which we took to be the phrase popularized so extensively of late by Narendra Modi, our Prime Minister, uh, rather than this business about the 21st century. So here's the deal. I do have longer term views well beyond the politics of the present. I've written many books on those themes. I will stick to the script I have, I have come prepared with because that was what I was told you were expecting. But when we have the Q&A discussion, which will follow, I'll be very happy to expand it beyond to issues that perhaps I would not have planned to address um, since I, I, uh, I was given to understand that what was expected was, was my perspective on this current rush to a new India that is being advanced by our powers that be. Before embarking on that, I, I should also add a personal word about what a joy it is to be back in the city, I've seen a number of familiar faces uh, in the audience, uh, old friends who mean a lot to me. The fact is that uh, many of my most impressionable years were here when the city was still known as Calcutta. Hmm? I moved here in, in 68, as a well, actually January 69, a couple of months shy of my 13th birthday, when my father was transferred to, to Calcutta. And I have to remind some of the younger people here that it really still had a fairly glamorous image, the former first city of the British Empire, uh, a place of, uh, yes, remembered grandeur, but, but, but some importance. It was still, though the days were fading, the bustling metropolis of the jute, tea, coal, iron and steel industries, uh, the city, of course, of the greatest cricket stadium in India, um, and, of course, uh, uh, already people 
were talking incessantly about the animated intellectual discussions in the coffee shops and on the pavement uh, bookstalls of College Street. Um, I had a weakness for the cakes at Furpo's, long since closed, sadly. And I was looking forward as a, about to become a teenager uh, to discovering the wicked delights that my naughty uncles would whisper to me about places called the Golden Slipper, the acme of all Indian nightclubs. Again, long since closed, I understand. Uh, so, uh, but you know, jokes apart, it was of course also all of those things and the city of Romindranath um, and the brilliant Shotidit Rai, uh, the, 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 the Bengali stage I still remember, though I obviously didn't understand a word of Bengali when I first came, but there was uh, Utpal Dot at his peak, Badal Sharkar's plays being performed. It was an extraordinarily exciting time. Um, and and um, when I think back on that Calcutta, obviously a lot of it has not survived, uh, but a lot of it has. And um, whether one is looking around at the magic of the Christmas lights in Park Street, which I sampled last Christmas, uh, whether it's the, um, the lively intellectual ferment as typified by yesterday's telegraph debate uh, on the lawns of the Calcutta Club, with an even larger turnout than this in, the, on, on, in that lovely location. Um, all of this, um, I think, is a reminder that this is no ordinary city. And so to come home to Calcutta, as in many ways it is, uh, intellectually home, I do want to say that, um, that I'm, I'm delighted to be amongst you all again. Uh, and, and of course, um, to talk about some of these issues that, that matter. Um, I might have spent longer in Calcutta. My initial plans as a high school student had been to study history at Presidency, which was then the most prestigious place to study history in, in India. But sadly, the campus disturbances around the turn of the decade, the dysfunctional politics of the state at that time, and the um, student violence that was accompanying it, not to mention the chronic postponements of exams, and the uncertainty about when you'll get your results and whether they really would be your results when you got them. All of that sent me away to St. Stephen's College instead. So there ended my sort of residence in Calcutta, but I have to say that um, I've come back uh, regularly and, and feel a tremendous warmth and affection for the city. But at the same time, um, we have this challenge of, of discussing New India, and there's no question there is a buzz about it. The Prime Minister used the words New India 11 times in his address to the nation on Independence Day from the ramparts of the Red Fort, and um, once again echoed, echoed those words or that phrase when he addressed us in the Lok Sabha last week. So it's fair to ask what is this New India that he's urging us to create? Um, he, of course, said a number of things that we don't have any problem, that I don't have any problem with. The idea of an India free from the shackles of casteism and communal tension, an India that successfully solves its endemic problems of corruption, nepotism, terrorism, an India where every woman, man, and child could be given an empowered and dignified standard of living, thanks to a society that harnesses India's entrepreneurial spirit to become an economic powerhouse. And I might add, those are not exactly his words, but those are his ideas. The words are mine because I'd already said all those things a few, a few years ago when I was in government. So I, very difficult for me to disagree with any of them. But the problem is when we hear them from the government, as usual between the rhetoric and the reality falls a great shadow. For all these statements and ideals, uh, the fact is that uh, there seems to be a complete lack of any specific steps, including budgetary provisions, to get our country to achieve any of this. In fact, what worries me is that this goal of a new India appears to be littered with the wreckage of all that was good and noble about the old India. So whether it's the Achedin of 2014, which still don't seem to have come, or the new India of 2018, which is again a, a little mirage down the road somewhere, my concern is that these phrases appear to be mere subterfuge and a smokescreen for the real agenda of a new India that this government has pursued since coming to power three and a half years back. Now, I know it's for a congressman to stand here before you and say this may sound like one more extension of the customary negative politics that's so prevalent in our country and that all of us uh, in the kind of 
class that, uh, that, uh, that is represented here so thoroughly sick of. I mean, I, I share uh, many, of the, many of my friends' wishes for a truly bipartisan politics that doesn't involve merely sniping at each other. And as you know, I've, I have actually been willing on a number of occasions, and not to my advantage, uh, to praise the government when praise was due. But the fact is that, um, that in my view, the key indicators uh, that would constitute this new India um, have, in fact, deteriorated. And that's why I feel that it's necessary to address this issue. As a progressive Indian, I too want a new India, but not this kind of new India. Because in the first half, uh, three and a half years of the, of the current government, more than half its term, almost, in fact, four-fifths its term, uh, a new brand of intolerant politics, one that capitalizes on the chauvinistic tendencies of members of the ruling party, has begun to consume our society. And though the Prime Minister speaks rightly of putting Indians first, it seems, unfortunately, that his followers uh, and his party put some Indians first and last. Their new India is an India where a narrow-minded majoritarianism prevails. Uh, since the party came to power, there have been repeated incidents of communal violence. Mob lynching has entered our lexicon. The Gaurakshak vig vig vigilantes have, have run amok. Human beings have been assaulted and even killed in the name of protecting the cow. Uh, Muslims and Dalits have been particularly victimized. The father of an Air Force Havildar, a 15-year-old boy returning from Eid shopping, a dairy farmer transporting cows with a permit, Dalits doing their job of skinning a dead calf have all been casualties of this new India. Four liberal and rationalist writers critical of the Sangh Paribar have been murdered. And yet, instead of strongly condemning the elements which have caused such events and conducted them, which is the least the government could do to actually help move India towards a new uh, India free of communal violence, sadly, members of the ruling dispensation have made disparaging remarks, either belittling the gravity of the communal tensions or even worse, pretending that nothing untoward is actually taking place. This has provided encouragement for these elements to continue with their targeted activities of barbarity and communal violence with complete disregard to the harmony of Indian society. The BJP's political and ideological allies openly deliver speeches that border on hate speech. They divide us, as one minister did, into Ramzadeh and Haramzadeh. They advocate ideas like mass conversions in the name of Gharvapasi and the elimination of beef eaters. They ignore and in some cases condemn the Taj Mahal, saying this is an un-Indian excrescence on the pristine soil of UP. And, of course, another minister, abetted by other fellow travelers, keeps asking critics of the Prime Minister to go to Pakistan. Now, I can understand why you'd want to send your enemies far away, but in that case, why Pakistan? Why not Canada? <laughs> but the fact is, of course, that Pakistan is, is a dog whistle to a certain base. It sends a certain message that those who are critical of this government are actually all Muslim lovers and must go off and live amongst uh, in, in a Muslim country. Now, this kind of thing, frankly, has become extremely, extremely dismaying. Um, the government is not only not lifting a finger against this, but I'm sorry to say it is portraying dissent as seditious, protest as anti-national, and free speech. Free speech is in trouble. I spent more time on that yesterday at the Calcutta Club, so I'll be brief here. But. Um, there is economic pressure on media owners because pretty much everyone who owns a media outlet also has another business. So there are vulnerabilities that have nothing to do with the media itself. Uh, there is also definitely outright political intimidation. There are attacks on journalists. Sadly, the attacks on journalists last year painfully catalogued by an international journalist group, the Reporters Without Borders, has ended up with India being ranked 136th out of 180 countries on the World Press Freedom Index. And if you think that's bad, it's actually even worse than you imagine, because Afghanistan is 120th. 
and we are now ranked 136. Now, all of these are illustrations of the petty bigotry and intolerance that passes for a ruling ideology in today's times. Um, there has also been the farce of what we've just witnessed on the film Padmavat, where a self-appointed group has taken upon itself the mantle of protecting the honor of the community for which it claims to speak, was not only able to create disturbances across three or four states in northern India, it was able to intimidate chief ministers into banning a film they hadn't seen, and when the ban was lifted by the Supreme Court to threaten theater owners so they wouldn't dare to show it, attacked buses, burned them, attacked a school bus while terrified children cowered for protection under the seats. All of this to prove what? It's proved one thing conclusively, that the BJP rule state governments in which all this happened are sadly unable both to protect the freedom of expression and to do their job of maintaining the rule of law and law and order in our country. So this is the kind of situation that's evolving and clearly it has to be a new India that we must stand up against and resist. The media is not much help in this because they have been completely distracted and diverted by the joys of sensationalism and yellow journalism, breaking news as they call it, uh, usually breaking people, and TRPs, the quest for which is all they care about. And yet, whereas the media normally has a role in challenging the government of the day, here the nation wants to know apparently only of the misdeeds of the opposition. Uh, this is the situation in which we are living. Well, the fact is that um, with Achedin having failed to materialize for three and a half years, people are anxiously saying, Buridin vapas liyao. The Achedin sloganeering has to be contrasted with the reality of the economic doldrums we're living in. Three and a half years of economic mismanagement has witnessed a 1.25% fall in the GDP's growth rate and successive Disruptive economic policies have hit our country, notably the demonetization disaster, a bad idea implemented badly, and the GST disaster, a good idea implemented badly. All the available data proves that demonetization was an unmitigated disaster, ill-conceived, unprepared, poorly implemented, a case of all pain, no gain. GST, on the other hand, would have actually been beneficial if it had really been conceived and implemented as a one nation, one tax scheme, which was the original idea when the UPA came up with it. Instead, the BJP took the UPA's design for a sleek horse and produced an ungainly camel. Not one nation, one tax, but one nation, three taxes, GST, SGST, IGST, and six tax rates. Now, such missteps have obviously far-reaching impacts on our economy. They've weakened the... Uh, Performance of the Indian economy in terms of conventional indices such as GDP growth rate, job creation, investment levels. In fact, you look at the GDP growth figures, which I'm sure you do in the Bengal Chamber, from 2015, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, you get 8%, 7.1%, and 6.75% respectively. A very clear downward curve. Activity and a clear slowdown in economic growth means actually the loss of millions of jobs. New project announcements have declined. Fresh investment is low. The informal sector is still reeling under the ill effects of demonetization when they laid off so many daily wage workers. Job creation is abysmal, and instead of the promised two crore jobs a year, it stands at about 2.5% of that target figure according to the government's own numbers. Exports are plunging. The manufacturing sector has slowed down, Agriculture is stagnating, indeed there's been practically no growth, and rural despair is so widespread that the number of farmer suicides has gone up 40% in the years of the present government. Um, so we can look at, at the kinds of things that BCC and I look at. New project announcements by Indian companies touched a 13-year low last December, uh, 77,000 crore, uh, was the total value of new project announcements in the December quarter. I'm looking at figures by the official Center for the Monitoring of the Indian Economy. 
The manufacturing sector has seen the sharpest fall, in fact, in this area, and bank credit growth, as I mentioned earlier, is abysmal. No wonder they're talking about a new India because they've made such a mess of the old India. Now, as I said, I want a new India too. It will be a new India where you don't get lynched for the food you eat, marginalized for the faith you hold dear, criminalized for the person you love, and imprisoned for making use of the fundamental rights guaranteed by your own constitution. Instead, we must look forward to a new India that celebrates and vindicates pluralism, which is, after all, given to us by our own history and our own historical experience. What would this idea of a new India mean to the progressive Indian? To my mind, it must be fundamentally rooted in the idea of India that our founding fathers believed in. As I've asked in a different context in my book about the British colonial period, I ask young people, if you don't know where you've come from, how on earth will you appreciate where you're going? So this nebulous idea of India, the phrase is Rabindranath Tagore's, is in some form or the other arguably as old as the nation itself. Nehru actually saw our country as an ancient palimpsest. Now, I've been accused repeatedly of using words no one understands. This was Nehru. But let me say what, um, what a palimpsest is. Imagine I come and write something on the wall, and then you come and write on top of what I've written without erasing what I've written. And she comes and writes on top of what you have written without erasing what either of us has written. And then she comes and writes on top of that. The net result of all of these things is a palimpsest. In other words, where contributions by multiple people have come in, nothing has been erased or even entirely superseded, simply that new elements have been added to the mix. That is ultimately the palimpsest that Nehru celebrated. And to my mind, uh, a vision that asserts this commonality is extremely important uh, for a country like ours. We not only just coexist, we thrive in our diversity. And that is our strength. I've just published a new book called Why I Am a Hindu, in which I quote Swami Vivekananda quite extensively, because I think the people who claim to be adhering to his precepts are the ones who haven't read him. Uh, he has uh, an amazing, uh, and of course, uh, he made many of his most powerful speeches in English, so that one actually doesn't even have to suffer the distortions of translation. And in his speech in Chicago to the World Parliament of Religions, what did Swami Vivekananda say? He said, my religion is one that has taught not just tolerance, but acceptance. Tolerance is a virtue. No one doubts that. But you know, at bottom, it is a rather patronizing emotion because tolerance says, I have the truth. You are in error, but I will magnanimously indulge you in your right to be wrong. Whereas acceptance says, I believe I have the truth. You believe you have the truth. I will respect your truth Please respect my truth. And this is the best way for all of us to get along in the society. And that's what made unity and diversity the most hallowed of independent India's self-defining slogans. I've always argued that India is much more than the sum of its contradictions. That the Indian idea is one that a nation may endure differences of caste, of creed, of color, of culture, of cuisine, of consonant, of conviction, of costume and custom and still rally around a consensus. And that consensus is on the simple democratic idea that in a diverse country like ours, you don't really need to agree all the time, so long as you will agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. The challenge today is that those ground rules are under threat. We are suddenly being told that if you refuse to say Bharat Mata Ki Jai, you are anti-national. Now, I have no problem saying Bharat Mata Ki Jai. As far as I'm concerned, it's, 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 it's one more slogan of many that I value. But if a Muslim friend of mine says to me that, look, my interpretation of my religion doesn't permit me to transform my nation into a goddess and worship her, therefore I will say Jai Hind or Jai Bharat, but I won't say Bharat Mata Ki Jai. I believe in my democracy, in my India, old or new, he has the right not to say it. Freedom of speech also includes the freedom of silence. But apparently, we now have a new India in which these litmus tests have to be applied. And that, to my mind, is not what we're all about. Because honestly, ours is an ever, ever land, if I can borrow from Peter Pan, a land that emerges from an ancient civilization, is united by a shared history, is sustained by a pluralist democracy, 
and one that by absorbing all these different influences in a spirit of acceptance gives us all the equal rights that we find reflected in our constitution. So my idea of India is very much uh, one that celebrates all of this. If America, I often tell American audiences, is a melting pot, then India is a thali. You know, we are a collection of different dishes, sumptuous dishes in different bowls. Each tastes different because it's in a different bowl. It doesn't necessarily flow into the next. But all these dishes belong together on the same plate and they complement each other in making the meal a satisfying repast. And so our democracy can't impose any narrow conformities on our citizens. The whole point about Indian pluralism is that you can be many things and one thing. You can be a good Indian, a good Muslim, a good Keralite, all at once. The Indian idea is actually the opposite of what the Freudians call the narcissism of minor differences. You know, when I was handling the civil war in the former Yugoslavia, these are all descendants of the same Slavic tribes that had settled in the Balkans in the 7th century. But history had given them different rulers. Their faith had taken, so one was Orthodox, one was Muslim, one was, uh, one was Catholic. But essentially, they're the same people. You know, just a thousand years ago, they all had common ancestors. And now they were busy butchering each other. Freudian scholars said this is the narcissism of minor differences. Well, in India, we celebrate the opposite. We celebrate the commonality of major differences. And that's something that I find precious and valuable in India with a newer role. So for new India to succeed and thrive, it seems to me it will have to embrace this inclusive India, draw inspiration from the key tenets that I have summarized for you, and by maintaining a commitment to democracy and pluralism, can we really, only by doing that, can new India truly fulfill the aspirations of all Indians, which of course is supposed to be the slogan, Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas. Now, we must also, of course, realize that what I've said to you is only half the battle. Because as the Bengal Chamber knows so well, there is the other half of the battle, and that is the economic battle. Providing a decent standard of living to the people of India, particularly those from the vulnerable groups, is absolutely indispensable. Our inclusive vision of a new India must be complemented by development as we move forward, development that um, uh, recognizes that as we seek to create a new India, we still have old battles to fight. That is, that we are still trying to ensure for everybody in our country, roti, kapra, or makan. That slogan has been around for so long. A film with that title was made 42 years ago, and yet now, we, uh, 43 years ago, and now, of course, We've complemented Roti, Kapra, and Makan with uh, Sadak, Bijli, and Pani, or at least drinking water. But that, too, is not a guarantee to everybody. And I'm sure with the next generation, uh, the ones who are amongst the younger people sitting in this room already, we will have to add to that the internet and mobile broadband. Because as I've explained in Parliament, for many of our young people, 4G is more important than Modiji. Uh, <laughs> And all of this, these are things that still need to be accomplished. The uh, prestigious Forbes magazine list of the world's top billionaires made room for 90 Indian dollar billionaires in the last list I saw, with a combined net worth of $295 billion, which is greater than the GDP of a majority of the member states of the United Nations. But at the same time, we have 363 million people living below the poverty line. And it's not the UN World Bank poverty line of $2 per person per day. It's, uh, I'm sorry, 1.9 is what they've, what they've come down at. But the Indian poverty line, which in rural India is calculated at 32 paise. I'm sorry, 32 US cents a day. In other words, a, a, a line that's been drawn just this side of the funeral pyre. This is our reality, and this is what our blueprint for a new India must address creatively, quickly, and securely. New India must be built on the liberalization we embarked upon in 1991. Economic growth was obviously vital to pulling people out of poverty. But the fruits of that growth, the revenues that come from our growth, must be shared with those who are marginalized and otherwise excluded from the benefits of our growth. The magic of the market, my dear friends, will not appeal 
to those who cannot afford to enter the marketplace. As India navigates its development, we must focus on ensuring that the benefits of our growth are shared across the nation, by our youth who are struggling to find jobs, and by our poorest for whom development is indispensable and needs to be life-changing. Any discussion, of course, about New India has to focus on the youth. Who are we building New India for, if not for the young? We have trained world-class scientists and engineers, but 431 million of our compatriots are still illiterate. We have more children who have not seen the inside of a school than any country in the world does. We have a great demographic advantage. 65% of our population is under 35. Half our population is under 25. There's 287 million Indians in the age group between 10 to 22, the future leaders of this country. This is potentially also a young, dynamic, energetic labor force that could deliver to us the demographic dividend that is so often proclaimed across global platforms at a time when the rest of the world, including our major competitors, are aging. So by 2020, the average age in Europe is going to be 46. In Japan, it's going to be 47. In America, even America, it's going to be 40. But in India, it'll be 29. So our youth will not just be part of our development story, they will drive it. But this means we have to provide them with both the education and the employment opportunities they need, and that too on an unprecedented scale. But education is getting short shrift from this government's advocates of New India. In the education budget over the last four years, we have seen it being halved from 6.15% of the total budget to 3.71% of the total budget. Um, nor does it have any specific schemes for youth, un youth unemployment. Uh, the old skill development scheme, which we initiated, is still not properly uh, got off the ground. The private sector is not participating in it. Uh, the young people may be celebrated as bhagya bidatas by our prime minister. But their reality is one of shrinking opportunities. Record lows in job creation are compounded, as I mentioned, by the negative impact of demonetization and the botched implementation of GST, so new jobs are simply not being created. Uh, and I'm referring to government figures here, not my own. Uh, one lakh, roughly, jobs created a year, 0.5% uh, uh, of the government's target. There's considerable rhetoric surrounding the sudden improvement in the EPF sign-ups. <coughs> but in fact, it seems to be uh, merely a renewed enrollment of people who had already got their jobs earlier. And according to the ILO, the number of jobless in our country will increase to 18.6 million in 2018 and 18.9 million in 2019 against 18.3 million in 2017. This is international labor organization figures obviously only reflecting the organized sector. And this is something very worrying because the World Bank says that 30.8% of our population between 15 and 29 years, that's almost a third of that crucial age group, which is where they're starting to work. Of that age group, 30.8% are not in education, not in employment, and not in training. So what future can we expect for them? No wonder that a recent survey reported that 70% of young Indians are anxious about their job perspectives. Development cannot be the preserve of just the older generations. New India cannot be the plaything only of old Indians. So we need this inclusive development. We need to ensure that promises made in abundance during election campaigns are actually realized and that it's not just left in the dust when the dust settles, as it were. Um, don't forget when Parliament is going to reopen only on the 5th of March, but when it does, every MP in Lok Sabha is conscious that he represents a majority of voters who are living on less than $2 a day. Every MP. There is no constituency, not even in Kolkata, where you have a majority of people who can claim an income above that level. And so inclusive growth is not just a slogan. It is about addressing the realities of our people. Whether we, whether we grow at 6% as we seem to be doing today or at 9% as we did during the bad old days of the UPA, 
Uh, what we really have to focus on is the 25%, the people at the bottom of our socioeconomic ladder whom we can't afford to leave out. And at the same time, we have to do something about the continuing exploitation of the poor. It was shameful for me as a former UN official to read a UN special rapporteur's report in which he says that public authorities are coercing individuals into building toilets by threatening to revoke their ration cards if they can't show that they built a toilet. That's, that's awful. We can't claim to be helping the poor by treating their human rights as, indis as, as dispensable, free to be traded for the purpose of fulfilling an individual policy aim. I mean, sanitation is important. Mahatma Gandhi even said sanitation is more important than independence. But it's not a substitute for food to keep yourself alive. Without food, you can't use that toilet. So let's please have a sense of priority and perspective. And I must say the same with the Aadhaar card. Somebody was joking at the Calcutta Club yesterday that uh, the IAS has now become the Indian Aadhaar Administrating Service. That seems to be what uh, the government uh, is, is focusing on increasingly. What was meant to be a voluntary way of getting benefits from the government is turning out to be a compulsory obligation of, of surrendering information to the government, and this despite a Supreme Court ruling. So it's all quite, quite alarming. Um, the ad hoc policies we're seeing around are not actually helping India's poorest or India's youth uh, because they're insufficient to the scale of the problem. And we need much more than the kinds of sound bites and slogans that we have been treated to. So if we can have policies that actually are made in consultation with those affected, we'll actually get better results. The lack of such consultation was readily apparent in a scheme that not only withdrew 86% of our country's money from circulation, but then cheerfully said, let's go digital. It's like taking 86% of the blood out of a person and then telling him, let's dance. You know? I mean, this, is, this is not particularly sensible. And, and as a result, um, it's not just the inconvenience the Prime Minister early, er, early expressed, but, but actually even in many cases a, lack, a loss of lives. Um, corruption for all the sloganeering by the government remains a chronic problem in our society um, and it's a daunting obstacle to our development. Um, I would not disagree with the government diagnosing the existence of corruption but to do so purely as a political vehicle or a political weapon to bludgeon the previous government with actually sadly overlooks the fact that India today under this government ranks 79th amongst the 175 countries on the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. And this is the perception of corruption by foreign investors coming into our country. So where has it disappeared? You can't just use it to attack the previous government, you have to deal with it today. Any foreign entity looking to set up business in India must deal with tedious rules, uncertain tax regulations, the tax terrorism of our tax inspectors, excessive paperwork, and inordinate delays in the processing of that, of that paperwork. Something as simple as registering a business takes two and a half days in Australia. It takes, with all the sloganeering of the present government, it still takes 30 days in India. And that doesn't even count the new registration for GST and the forms you have to fill for that and so on. Um, so there's not much yet to celebrate about the ease of doing business. Um, it's, it's interesting that Bhutan and Nepal fare better than us in the ease of doing business, uh, and of course, so does, so does China. And many of you probably know this from direct experience. I know I'm preaching to the, to the experts. Then the critical issue of infrastructure. We have to do a great deal, but a bullet train is not going to get the bulk of our population moving through our, through our, uh, through our country. The internet, still very much a realm full of opportunities, still sadly out of reach for most Indians, but at the same time, one in which the government has hoarded spectrum to such a point that even today we have amongst the slowest broadband uh, speeds in the world. I saw a list of 92 countries, um, or major countries, major economies in the world, in terms of average broadband speed, we are 92nd. So that's how bad we are in this, in this situation. And the government has struggled to provide Wi-Fi connectivity to even 10% of our rural areas. So at one point there was airy talk, President Kalam was a big advocate of that, that why don't we just uh, take development directly to the villages, provide them Wi-Fi and broadband, and they can run their BPOs out of a village. You don't have to be sitting in Gurgaon to answer a, a call being made in Boston. 
But today, none of that is happening because the infrastructure connectivity is not there, and our um, uh, average internet connection speed is slower than Sri Lanka, than Vietnam, and it's, it's, it's an embarrassment all around. Um, so we need to look at the bigger picture. I'm going to try and wrap this up so we can have an exchange with each other and address the questions that are on your mind. The point is that the fundamentals need to be done, as I've said, uh, and at the same time, we do have to understand that some of the basics need to be attended to. I haven't mentioned healthcare yet, but I should because we saw a big song and dance in the last budget about the so-called Moody Care. Now, we all know that a health setback can be catastrophic for a poor family. When the breadwinner gets a serious illness, that means they often have to not just stop getting their income, they may have to sell their home, their land, just to treat the person. Entire families can be destroyed for generations by one major illness. So we need to provide some kind of protection. But instead of the government taking on the responsibility of providing that, they've come up with this incredibly uh, ambitious scheme and then put no money in the budget to finance it. In fact, the healthcare budget today is actually lower than it was under UPA. It is only 1.4% of GDP. And my horror about all of this is that the method chosen, even if they find the finance, which they haven't yet, is only going to put money in the pockets of the insurance companies and not necessarily that of the beneficiaries. As we've seen from similar earlier attempts by this government on crop insurance, the Fasal Bhima Yojana, where taxpayers have paid 36,000 crores of rupees to the government because of the scheme, and only 2,000 rupees have been paid out to farmers whose crops failed. All the rest has gone to the insurance companies. Now, if some of you here are in insurance, no doubt it's a great deal, but for the rest of us, that's not a chedin. Now, I, I do want to, um, to um, bring this to a close and, and talk a little bit uh, about um, what uh, we see as, as the lodestar, the, the goalposts, as it were, of a new India. Uh, we certainly are not fans of the Hindi, Hindu, Hindutva brand of defining new India. What we want in India is unity. They want uniformity. We want consensus. They want conformity. We seek to empower people. They seek, sadly, to silence them. And therefore, it's extremely important that we have an ideology that binds people together rather than separates one Indian from another. At the same time, we need to strengthen the democratic institutions that keep us going. We need very much uh, to have transparency and accountability through, for example, the Right to Information Act, which is being hollowed out in practice in current days. We need institutions to be strengthened, not weakened. We need something better than one man rule. Uh, a leadership that empowers our people is the only kind of India that can truly be worthy of the term New India. We can't just have all these slogans, make an India, digital India, star, star, start up India, stand up India, sit down India. I mean, at, the, at this point, especially after four years, all we've seen is slow down India. We really need to, to, to not just worry about the prospects of saying that India is doing well, which we all want it to do well, but who it's doing well for. And I think we can have a new India that belongs to all of us, led by a government that works for all of us, or we can have a new India that belongs to some of one particular religion or one particular version of that religion and serves the interests only of a few. We can choose a new India that embodies hope or one that promotes fear. We can support a new India that's united in striving and aspiration or an India new, perhaps, that's divided by hatred and bigotry. To my mind, it seems to me that if we want to have a new India, we would all celebrate. It must be one that stays together, that works together, that dreams the same dreams together. Such an India can still make the 21st century our own. Thank you very much. Jen. That's all right. And with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, may I set the ball rolling with two very simple questions that I have uh, for Dr. Tharoor. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Shashi, about the demographic advantage of India uh, and 
education becomes a very important part in, in uh, and I remember in one of your tech talks possibly in 2013, you mentioned about the four E's in terms of expansion, uh, uh, equity, uh, excellence, and employability. Right, uh, so what's a quick prescription for you at, at the policy level to make all that happen uh, going forward? That was question one. And question two, uh, we have uh, uh, disruptive changes that we see uh, in terms of automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, you name them. And the specter of a jobless growth sort of stares us in the face. So in the Indian context, how do we negotiate that? A quick prescription. Both very good questions. On the education one, frankly, I think the expansion thing we've done reasonably well in that we have dramatically multiplied the number of educational opportunities available uh, to Indians. Um, is this audible? Yeah. Uh, to Indians in the, um, uh, in the education space. Uh, but it's somewhat skewed. Um, so for example, uh, we are producing half a million engineers a year, 500,000 uh, engineering graduates, and a startling 82% of them, according to a recent study, end up in professions that do not require an engineering degree. So there is a mismatch between the kind of, kind of education we are inflicting, or that our parents, particularly middle class parents, are obliging their children to do, and the actual needs of the marketplace. Whereas firms that do require certain kinds of engineering qualifications don't find them from these 500,000 graduates. So that's a real problem. I mean, of course, companies like TCS and uh, Infosys have tried to compensate for this by creating their own campuses, which look like de facto universities. They hire people with a degree, and then they give them a whole year's education to make up for what they should have learned at university but didn't. But that isn't good enough, and there needs to be I, I was an advocate when I was minister uh, of much more symbiosis between the um, academic world and the real world, the world of industry, much more interface between the two, and not enough of that is happening. Uh, the other aspect is that there are some professions that are completely underserved. There is an artificial scarcity in medical education, which is entirely controlled by vested interests. I'm sorry if the doctors here may not agree with me. I do believe it's important to maintain standards. But we have created a situation in where it's practically impossible uh, for a, a very good student who is not outstanding to get into uh, an affordable medical uh, education, particularly in a government uh, or public sector institution. And I have had, you know, really had the heartbreak of seeing uh, relatively poor families' children come to me uh, who have just missed admission into such an institution by one or two percent, and their families simply cannot afford private education, and their families are simply unable thereafter to, uh, uh, to, to get a loan because banks will not give them loan without collateral, even though we have as a matter of policy urged that, um, in fact, um, education loans should be without collateral because your collateral is the degree you're going to earn, which will give you your income to pay back the loan. But all of this isn't happening. So this is another serious area. I find it sad that now we have Indian students um, uh, having to go abroad for studies. I mean, why is it that uh, our Indian parents, obviously the better off amongst them, are spending three billion US dollars a year in sending Indian students abroad? There's something wrong with that picture. Uh, I want to create an India in which one day Americans and Brits will come to India to study. And to do that, because we have the ability to do that, don't forget that I'm not saying anything new because Nalanda used to receive students from as far east as China, Japan, and Korea, and as far west as Turkey and Persia, 1,400 years ago. So that's, it would simply be returning to the kind of standards we once had. But we have had those standards drummed out of us. We need to recapture them. On your second question, which was um, jobless, um, growth. jobless growth and automation, robotics, all of that, this is a real issue that we need to focus on in our country. When the Prime Minister says make in India, I actually, despite my joke earlier, I don't disagree with the objective of trying to get people to come and make in India. But he's asking companies to make in India things which they will no longer make through human beings anywhere. They will now get robots to make these things. 
It's very striking. Many of you may remember when Make in India was first announced, the first big signature flagship project of Make in India was a $3 billion investment announced by Foxconn. You all remember that? We have not seen one penny of that investment. Not one hole has been driven into the ground to lay a foundation. And I don't believe that's ever going to come. Because I think that after the announcement was made, advances in technology, in robotics and automation and so on, have got them to a point where Foxconn is asking itself, why should we spend $3 billion hiring a whole bunch of Indian workers and we'll have to pay and give medical leave and union benefits and educate their children and all of that, when perhaps for a comparable capital investment or maybe slightly less, we can invest in smart robots that will do the same work and will not need leave and, uh, and, 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 and uh, will not unionize and all of those things. So it's, it's, a, it's a worrying thought. Then you've got the uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is transforming our opportunities in a very negative direction. I'll give you two examples. You know that India is the world leader in an interesting profession called medical transcription. That is that an American doctor would see his patients during the day, dictate his notes into a machine or a recorder at the end of his day. The notes would be zinged over to India where a medically qualified transcriber who understands the medical terms involved would actually type them up. Then the Indian would zing them back on the internet and the doctor, having gone to bed, having dictated his notes, comes in in the morning and gets his notes all typed up and ready to go. Sounds like a wonderful thing. Indians were doing wonderfully on it. We had really, we were the market leaders. I think we had 95 or 98 percent of the world market in medical transcription services offshore. Now what's happened? In the West, thanks to artificial intelligence, voice recognition technology has got to such a point that that doctor can simply dictate. He just has to buy the software once, then he dictates it into that software and he finds his own words coming up on the screen. He doesn't need the Indian who might make one or two typing mistakes per page. Who knows? He doesn't need the Indian anymore. He can just do it that way. Second example also in the health field is that we were also world leaders in the deciphering of MRIs. Because an MRI is an expensive thing to read. You need a qualified radiologist to read it. And in America, there's a scarcity of radiologists and they cost a lot of money. So a lot of American hospitals were actually transmitting their MRIs to India and an Indian radiologist earning one-fourth or one-sixth of his American counterpart was reading the MRI and giving the analysis back to America. Again, artificial intelligence is stepping in. A machine with smart software, probably written by some Indian sitting in Silicon Valley, is now going to do that reading of the MRI. So you have to understand that we are facing a real challenge. Areas in which we thought we were in the cutting edge of globalization are going to be disappearing from under our feet. And then, of course, we have the perhaps more far-fetched scenario of the driverless car coming to India. I, too, believe it's a little further away than people think. But it is inevitable in some places. Um, and when the driverless car comes, there are some immediate economic impacts and consequences. Everyone is only talking about the positives. Fewer accidents, fewer parking spaces needed, more ride-sharing possible. Um, no one will need to own their own car. No one will need to have um, uh, uh, parking lots in every street and so on. So all of the stock is fabulous. But, and in fact, a friend of mine in Singapore, I remember, was giving me a ride after lunch, and he said to me, uh, this is my last new car. And I said, I beg your pardon? Uh, you're a young man, you'll go on for a while. He said, no, no, no. B by the time this car is old enough that I need to buy a new car, all of Singapore will be driverless, I'm sure. And in a small manageable island city like Singapore, perhaps that is indeed true. But in India, you bring in driverless cars to replace the existing cars, and um, you can imagine 25 million Indians have no other profession than driving. What happens to them? And then, of course, what happens to our streets? Because, you know, if you bring in driverless cars, well, that are still driver-driven cars. And it's going to be like switching from driving to the uh, driving on the right to driving on the left uh, gradually. <laughs> you know, it'll either have to be all or nothing. You know, if we have a road with a driverless car, only driverless cars should be allowed on it. But anyway, I mention all of this to say that technology is going to be disruptive and not in a good way, that we are going to have to pay a price, and we better scramble quickly 
to see how we can take advantage of it. Now, there's an obvious answer. So before one of you think it, let me say it. All technological change does drive some people out of work and does give opportunities to others. Uh, when the automobile was invented, you had the crisis affecting the buggy whip manufacturers because the whips that were used to flog the horses that drove the horse-drawn carriages suddenly were no longer being made. You also had, of course, when silent movies became talkies, literally tens of thousands of musicians lost work because every movie theater had a live orchestra playing alongside the silent movie. And suddenly, when they, you had a soundtrack, you didn't need them anymore, and they all lost work. And there was much mourning and lamentation, but no one uninvented the automobile, and no one uninvented the soundtrack. Uh, the world went on, people found new work. Now, in, in the same thing may or may not happen, but the big challenge is, it won't be the same people finding new work. You may suddenly need a whole bunch of jobs in servicing robots, but the drivers who've been fired from driving their vehicles are not going to be the ones doing that work. And there's a human cost that politicians like me will have to worry about. Jobless growth, therefore, means that we may have to seriously reorient our emphasis in economic development policies. I've been for a long time of the view that we are emphasizing the wrong things. We need to emphasize areas of our economy that absorb people, and absorb not just people, but relatively low-skilled, unskilled, semi-skilled people. Tourism is the classic area. We ought to be investing six times the amount of money this government is investing on tourism. We ought to be improving tourist infrastructure. We ought to be subsidizing or giving tax concessions to the constructions of hotels. We need to be transforming the tourist landscape. First of all, it's absurd that a country with the astonishing sites, natural as well as ancient ruins and medieval ruins and so on that we have, are not, not attracting tourists. We're not attracting tourists because our infrastructure is woeful. If we can create that, you know, a, a, a busboy at a hotel or a Mali's assistant or a waiter doesn't need uh, an education. So the fact that the government is only spending 1.4% of GDP on education will not hurt. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, questions. Thank you. Uh, what I would like to say is a good speech you gave, focusing mainly on the failures of the BJP government. S similarly, from 2004 to 2014, we heard similar speeches from BJP. I know. And we got BJP into power. In 2019, we may again hear the same speeches if you all come to power from BJP. So at the end of the day, the politicians are failing us. They yes. only talk when they are in the opposition, but when they come to the government, they become the same as we are facing today. So I would like to have your views on that. As I said in my remarks, I was very conscious that many of my friends are going to say this is again the same old negative politics. And I said it because not just to preempt the question, which came anyway, but, uh, but also because I myself belonged, if you like, to that apolitical, professional middle class that is so well represented in this, in this room. And for people like me and my family, this is what we were doing all the time. We were complaining about the politicians. Now, in a democracy, politics is the only means we have to determine our own destiny, to change the future direction of our country. We might wish for a better kind of politics, but politics is it. One of the ways you can get a better set of politicians is by electing them. And one of the ways that you can actually have a better set of politicians to choose from is by joining them. I was willing to take the plunge. I was willing to take the plunge, give up all the comforts of a rather well-paid life in the Western world, and come here for what was then a 16,000 rupees a month salary, since then raised to 50,000, but many people protesting, how dare the MPs triple their salary? By, if you knew what we were supposed to do with that 50,000, you would take pity on us rather than object, but that's another story. Um, here you've got a profession which many people in this room say we are, are, are ashamed of or we, we don't think that they're doing a good job. The best thing to do is do their job better for them. Give them a challenge. If all of you just sit and enjoy the luxury of complaining, how will the country progress? We'll still be stuck with politicians whom we're not particularly proud of uh, making the decisions that then affect all our lives. 
So my critique is not just the uh, critique of a politician from an opposition party. I think I have proved time and time again that when the right thing is said, I'm willing to support it. I paid a price for it also in my own party. My argument is that there must be a coherent vision. There must be means to fulfill that vision. And I must say that, you know, very often Mr. Modi's speeches are extremely impressive. I, I've often said this, his diagnosis of some of the issues facing our country, or most of the issues facing our country, is not at all a bad diagnosis. The gap is between the diagnosis and the prescription, and between the prescription and the delivery of the, of the drugs that's taking place. Mr. Modi's challenge in many ways is that he is ruling on the back of a profound contradiction. He does have an economic vision for the development of this country. But to be able to implement it, he needs the support of the stormtroopers of the RSS, the loony right fringe of the Gaurakshaks and the car vigilantes, and therefore he is unwilling to curb them. So the result is that the objective of economic development is being undermined by the distractions of communal intolerance and attacks on the Taj and attacks on minorities and so on, which if he were in a different position, he would simply say, stop it, this is not us. This is not what I stand for. Uh, you know, sh I shut you up, uh, you know, I disown you, I expel you from my party, or I drop you from my council of ministers. He doesn't do that. Many of the ministers who have said the most outrageous things are still in his council of ministers. Many of the worst statements, such as the one saying that Gandhi's statue should be replaced by Natharam Godse's, have been made by MPs who have been entrusted with major parliamentary responsibilities by his government. So the problem is, if they're going to give us things that are such obvious targets to criticize, why shouldn't we criticize them? When you all come to power, you don't deliver what you are telling us See, today. There I that is the question. There, there I disagree. I think that there's been a tremendous amount of delivery. In fact, I, I wrote an article in 14, 2014 about the actual transformations that have been wrought about by UPA with facts and figures that were not contested. In many ways, those of you who will make an effort to think back on the India of 2004 and the India of 2014 know how much actually got transformed in literally every domain. And that included things like the invention of the, the Right to Information Act, which suddenly opened up transparency of government in a way we'd never seen before. The Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which massively increased purchasing power of the rural poor and reduced significantly distressed migration from the rural areas to the cities. In Riga is one of the reasons why you're not having that many people from neighboring states sleeping on the sidewalks uh, of, this, of this city. So there were very significant successes, plus all the figures for GDP growth, manufacturing growth, agriculture growth, everything testifies to change. But the negativism of the opposition party and the receptivity of the media to that negativism contributed to a perception that nothing had actually worked, which was, as I said, demonstrably not true. And then secondly, the one thing that most Indian voters are extremely sensitive to is inflation. And the fact is, when UPA came to power in 2004, oil was $40 a barrel, the dollar was 40 rupees. By the end of UPA, oil was $140 a barrel, and the dollar was 60 rupees. So every increase in a dollar also hit 50% more on the Indian consumer. By the time you got to that point, whatever subsidies the government could afford to offer had been exhausted, and the Indian consumer was feeling the pain, feeling the pinch, and saying, we will vote against this government because they hurt us in our wallets. And Mr. Modi, to his all good luck, presided over a complete collapse of international oil prices. He didn't reduce prices for all of you at the petrol station. He just quickly levied more taxes and duties so that his government could bolster its coffers and show a reduction in the fiscal deficit. Now, let's face it, one can go into all of these details as much as you like. At the end of the day, you're telling an opposition party, don't be negative. But that doesn't work because when you're not negative, people say to you, where is the opposition? Why can't you stand up against these injustices? So ultimately, in a democracy, there is no choice. The opposition must oppose. And the public has to choose between the merit of the opposition's case and the merit of the government's case. Ultimately, though, we all need to see this country progress. And it's disappointing to me that many of the hopes on the basis of which Mr. Modi was elected in 2014, not many, all, have not been fulfilled. 
Indeed, very well analyzed, very well analyzed. May we have the next question, please? Uh, well, if, if we could just have, yes. yep. No, no, uh, why, why don't you ask the question? Rita, Rita, he offered you the mic. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Shashi, while you've blown us away with your rhetoric and your brilliance, um, you've also given us a very uh, bleak, bleak, bleak palimpsest to use your own words, of the new India. Uh, and I'd like you to focus on one particular area, which is the media. You talked about the media being on the back foot. Self are a columnist, a writer, an author, a thought leader. But yet you've talked about the freedom of the press being in the pits. What would your prescription be for a freer media uh, where uh, it is not controlled so much by the owners whom you said are looking at various other businesses apart from the media. I'd like to have your views. <coughs> very, very tough one to answer because in fact, obviously media is an expensive proposition, especially if you want a physically available medium, whether it's a television screen, whether it's a, a printed newspaper or magazine, it costs money. And very few people have that kind of money, and therefore those who have it are usually people who have surplus resources from other businesses, and they're the ones, therefore, who are vulnerable. All you have to do is, you don't have to censor a publication, you just have to call the owner and say, ah, oh, I noticed this article in your magazine, and by the way, was there a tax issue regarding your last business? And that'll be the end of the writer or the editor of that magazine. That's That kind of thing is, is, is always available. Um, uh, and of course, the reliance of many publications on government advertising. Uh, Indian, uh, India is very unusual because our government advertises, most Western democracies, governments are not in the business of advertising. So the dependence of, of Indian publications on, on government advertising is so high that simply pulling the plug on that can bring a publication to heel. These are genuine challenges. Now, one way out is, is, is the one that's being demonstrated by The Wire, which is essentially a non-profit financed by foundations and by voluntary contributions by its readers. The Guardian in the UK is trying a similar model. Um, in the case of The Wire, it's only digital. So its success or its impact will be restricted to those who are reading uh, digitally. Uh, this is not going to be a newspaper sort of being delivered at your doorstep containing the articles from The Wire. It's going to be uh, only on your mobile phone or on your internet screen. But that may be at the moment the only viable alternative model I can see out there uh, that will reduce the kind of dependence I described to you. Um, whether they remain viable also depends on the generosity of foundations and readers. So that too. I mean, governments can find ways of curbing all of this. If the government really turned hostile, they could easily, for example, challenge those who are financing the buyer by auditing the foundation's accounts or whatever and challenging that. They could also, they could also um, make it difficult to make financial transfers to the account uh, of the publication. There are all of these risks inherent. Those haven't happened yet. But I'm just saying that there is no foolproof model. This seems to be the model that comes closest to a media that is free of the interference of both government and owners. Sorry, Shashi, but you mentioned the wire. Now, the wire is not entirely free. Mm. It is funded by a whole lot of very big business houses. I know that. So the how can they huh? be free? How can they be ex uh, you know, expected to express uh, independent opinions when they are founded by and funded by those very business houses. Well, they've explained to me they've only taken money from foundations, not from business houses. So it's not from Mr. Azim Premji or Wipro, it's from the Azim Premji Foundation. It's that kind of thing. So a foundation is a charitable venture and that's therefore different. But frankly, short of that, as I said, everything that costs money, somebody has to have the money to finance it. So at the end of the day, you're either saying that there will be no truly independent media ever, or you're saying that um, the only hope is in changing the culture, as it were, of, of the, of the uh, country and the readers and our society, so that journalists themselves value and prize independence of thought, of action, of opinion in their own writing in a way that ensures perhaps 
that if, say, tomorrow an independent journalist, if every journalist is independent, then editors and owners may hesitate to pressurize the person, and that person uh, might sort of shake up the whole industry by resigning if he's pressurized. But we are far from that kind of culture in our country so far. Thanks. Yes, sir. Like, like most of us, my tribe, I mean, we have actually all want, we have been, I mean, I've been also very passionate about seeing things happen, seeing change happen in our country. And one of, seeing our country grow and progress in all respects. And as a matter of fact, the biggest disappointment that I have had personally in the earlier part of my career was that almost throughout my career, was that we served coalition. I mean, the polity was a coal led, led by a coalition government. Okay. It's only towards the end of my career that we found that the people of India thought it fit to vote back majoritarianism in the political setup. Now, strangely, it happened in a state. It happened in the government of India. And in one case, it became a question of, if you're not with me, you know, you belong to some other rival political organization. And the other case, it became that if you're not with me, you're anti-national. You know? Now, we don't know what's going to come up. Your party is saying repeatedly that be prepared for elections at the end of the year. You know? uh, I, I don't know what, I mean, and I understand what you said today has been brilliant. As always, I'm a great fan of yours. Thank you. I read all your books. But the, the uh, I, I don't still see, you know, like many of us, I mean, it's too late for me to join politics. I mean, that's a good suggestion that you put. But uh, I don't have that aspiration either. But the fact is that I don't see, you know, how there's going to be any change. Because if we go back, you know, it will again probably be a, some kind of coalition, you know, uh, 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 horse cart, which is just not going to move because the cart will move before the horse. Okay. And if it is not so, I don't know what's in it for the Indian, for the average Indian. So if you have a comment on that, I'd appreciate this. Well, you know, the, is there a better way? And the answer is clearly no. I mean, we, we have a democracy. We have a system in which people can choose their own uh, political leaders, help determine their own destiny in that way. And that ultimately is a system we are operating. So we are trying to work within that system to bring about the best possible outcome. And having said that, I agree with you that uh, very often there is frustration, there is despair, there is disappointment, there is a sense that, you know, what's the point? We vote for these guys, but nothing really changes, all of that. Um, and, and I know that the, the, the disappointment is all the greater when one particular individual seems to have roused so many kinds of hopes among some. I don't think not, not everyone, but among some. And, and therefore, those hopes suddenly seem to have been belied. And that really raises a particular question. My gut answer to you on this is, we've had ups and downs in our polity, but we've made progress. Look where we were in 1947, country with 90% of the population living below the poverty line, uh, with 17% literacy, with life expectancy, just 27. Um, uh, literacy, uh, as I've already mentioned, what else is there? Pretty much infant mortality, maternal health, maternal mortality, everything in abysmal world-shaming world levels. And where we've come today, uh, the 90% below the poverty line is 26%. Still too high, but better than, <laughs> a lot better than 90. The life expectancy has gone from 27 to 69, almost approaching the biblical three score and 10. Uh, we've got um, uh, literacy rates has gone from 17 to 79. And women were 8.8% in 1947. Today they're up to 69%. So in all sorts of ways, progress has been made that we refuse sometimes to acknowledge or celebrate. Because of the magnitude of what is yet to be accomplished, let us not lose sight of what we have done in our society. I think progress has been made, and from that we can draw heart that we can get there. Good afternoon, Dr. Tharoor. Uh, 
we uh, know what the narrative of the present government is. We also know the alternative narrative. Why don't we see uh, economic uh, 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 a budget being presented in the parliament in the form of an alternative narrative? Or why don't we see when uh, there is a political campaign going on, the leader of the opposition not going to a Somnath temple and proving that there is an alternative narrative? Thank you. Well, um, the two different issues you raised. Offering an alternative budget is certainly something that I support. I have to admit that I'm in a minority view on this because um, the view amongst the experienced politicians, far more experienced than myself, is that when somebody else is in power, it is our job to critique what they are claiming rather than offering an immediate alternative. We come up with alternatives only when the elections are near. And I personally don't like that. I would have liked very much. I think if we had come up with an alternative budget that shows how we would have allocated resources differently, how we would have put more into certain kinds of essential welfare, less into other things, uh, I think we would have been able to make an impact on the imagination of people like yourself. Sadly, we haven't done that. We are not doing it. Um, but I'm quite willing to convey this idea yet again uh, in, in the party leadership. My thought, though, is that, um, is that when you mention something like the Somnath Temple, you're not being entirely fair because by not doing that, we would have simply ceded or abdicated a certain narrative to the other side, which was going around saying to voters, look, we are good, devout, believing Hindus like you, vote for us. Whereas what the debate should really be is about development. So we, when our leader goes to these temples, he's saying, hey, don't worry, they may be claiming to be good, devout Hindus, we're also good, devout Hindus. Now let's put that issue aside. There's no difference there, uh, other than on the kind of Hinduism we practice. But we are also good Hindus. Now you let's talk about Vikas. Let's talk about whether your life has been improved in the last few years. Let's talk about whether development has actually worked for you. And that sort of uh, message is only possible when you neutralize the Hindutva argument by taking it out of contention, rather than leaving it completely to one side to capitalize on. Very well replied. Uh, uh, we are slightly running late. We need to wrap up in the next five or 10 minutes. Two more questions, please. Can I ask, please? Sure, please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thanks yep. a lot for your wonderful speech. Uh, my question is, um, it might be digressing a bit, but in the last 10 years or so, there had been like, for example, the Arab Spring, and there have been issues in Turkey, there had been uh, Brexit, there had been uh, protectionism in uh, USA. And uh, today, in the last three, four years in India, we have found some sort of a disillusionment or uh, people are not very satisfied with what has happened over the last century, few decades rather. In such an environment, do you feel that uh, people are going to buy when they say, okay, uh, I have given uh, this NDA last four years or five years, I would rather give another five years when Congress has not done for the last 30, 40 years. And when even if you are pouring in figures from ILO and WHO and uh, blah, blah, different transparency index, they are not buying those figures, but they are rather buying the figures from World Bank Development Index. In such a scenario, how are you going to convince them that something that is not happening and they're not going to happen? And uh, I would rather, I'd rather the Congress as an individual can come back and again do it as a party. Okay, well first, on, on the first part of your question, you're quite right, there is a backlash at the moment around the world, not just in India, against the economic developments of the last 25 years. Uh, it's being called anti-globalization for short. Uh, and it seems to me that in fact, it's actually two backlashes. There is an economic backlash, particularly in the Western countries where workers have felt that the gains of globalization have just gone to the rich, that workers have seen their jobs being Bangalore or Shanghai sent away to foreign countries and they're fighting back against that. They want to regain their economic clout, even though that may already be a lost battle. And the second uh, uh, anti-globalization backlash is the cultural backlash, which um, is essentially against cosmopolitanism, against immigration, against uh, uh, the kind of Davos, uh, you know, integrated global networks kind of approach in the name of a more rooted authenticity, a more sort of religiously based cultural nationalism. Uh, also ethnic and racist issues come up. So when Mr. Trump says make America great again, he's also implying make America white again. Uh, when Marine Le Pen openly campaigns against immigration, it's against the brown and black people in her country. All of these things 
are, are, are definite factors. In fact, you mentioned Turkey, but I think Turkey and India are interesting exemptions. Both Erdogan and Modi are very much part of the cultural backlash. They both speak in terms, in Erdogan's terms, of more authentically Muslim Turkey and uh, Modi of a more Hindu uh, Hindustan. But they are not part of the economic backlash. They want to be Davos man. They don't want to, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, reject Davos man. Uh, but anyway, you've got these two backlashes which overlap for some cases, don't overlap as in the case of uh, Turkey and India. But at the end of the day, what most people are concerned with is what affects them directly. For most Indian workers who have been touched by globalization, so far it's been positive. Globalization for them has meant that somebody sitting in America is calling them about their credit card bills. Or that somebody um, uh, in Philips or Boeing is paying them in a uh, research lab in India to design stuff for them to manufacture and consume abroad. So in all of these ways, globalization, the vast majority of people who have been touched have benefited from globalization. The one exception would probably be those kinds of small industries which have been wiped out by Chinese imports, or Chinese exports to us, um, which um, have been made possible because of India's greater integration into global trade networks. So, for example, the business of dyes, D-Y-E, is apparently completely been wrecked by cheaper Chinese chemicals. Um, similarly, one hears that a lot of things from fireworks in Shivakashi to, um, to uh, the manufacturing of little murtis is, is seriously under threat because China can do everything cheaper and to scale and including the shipping cost, uh, as long as duties remain low, they're able to, to undercut the Indian manufacturer in India, in the Indian market. So these are all um, real issues, but by and large, that's it on the globalization front. Now, your second part of your question was about how we're going to uh, convince people that things are good or bad. For me, the answer is very simple. I think we would simply have to ask the vast majority of people, are you better off? Is the youth who was promised a job by Mr. Modi in his campaign speeches in 2014, does he have a job? Is the housewife who paid 390 rupees for a gas cylinder under UPA and is now paying 790 rupees because Mr. Modi removed all her subsidies, is she happy about it? Is the um, youth on a scooter or the driver of an auto rickshaw going to the petrol and diesel pump and paying more for petrol than in UPA's time at a time when international prices crashed dramatically during the intervening period? Is he happy about it? We will be asking these questions. We will say if you are happy paying these higher prices, if you feel your economy has been well managed, if you're a daily wage worker who you lost your job because the demonetization took away the cash that your uh, bosses had to pay you your salary, if all of those things don't bother you, by all means, you know, vote for more of the same. But if you have suffered personally, as the vast majority of Indians has, then you better think about voting for us. I mean, in Gujarat, the only thing that saved the BJP was... Gujarati Asmita, the pride of the Gujaratis and their son being the Prime Minister of India. Otherwise, people were massively unhappy and precisely on these issues. And, you know, those of us who are just reading the uh, media or watching certain channels on television are completely unconnected to the real frustrations of ordinary people. But those of us who have to go out politically and talk to ordinary people are finding a very receptive climate. Don't get me wrong. This country is seething more and more in frustration at the promises broken, the disappointments expressed, the word not kept, and the overblown rhetoric is increasingly being seen as hollow. You know, it's all very well to um, point to certain successes. Every single success this government can point to, without exception, is a UPA scheme that they had tried to obstruct when they were in opposition, but they have adopted and implemented since. But that is, Jandhan was what we call direct benefits transfer. FDI in retail, they held up parliament against it. Now they're implementing it. Uh, insurance, I mean, you name it, the bankruptcy code. GST itself, they had blocked for six years uh, when, we, when we tried to introduce it. And then they ended up botching it up in their implementation. You can't point to a single accomplishment. The only thing that we would not have done that they did was demonetization. And thank God, because we, we would never have done such a, such, such a stupid economic policy uh, had we been in power. So you look around concretely and say, other than that, where are the promises you've made and how have you failed to keep them? There's just been some wonderful speeches, some great rhetoric, memorable alliteration, slogans. 
नारे से पेट तो भरता नहीं है सो आई थिंक दैट पीपल आर गोइंग टू हैव अ रियल रीजन नॉट टू सपोर्ट दिस गवर्नमेंट थैंक्स विल हैव द लास्ट क्वेश्चन प्लीज सर मिस्टर कपूर या आई थिंक द वन most important problem this country is facing and is continue to face which no political party ever raises now is population explosion is there any talk on this even in closed doors or in uh, ways this could be tackled because i see this going to be a major issue in the years to come it is and it isn't in some ways um the old understanding of population has now been discredited that is that people are not poor because they have too many children they have too many children because they're poor because in poverty you have children since you don't know whether they'll survive you have them in quick succession they actually are used from childhood as an economic asset you send them out to the fields to work to assist in the chai shop to go and weave a carpet to go and make a football whatever it is all of these things that children are made to do in very poor families the moment you have serious development that entire picture changes the child is going to school now the child is getting a midday meal at school of course but apart from that the child need not be sent to work or the child is potentially later economic asset you don't need to have that many more children because you now have more and more assurances thanks to government health care that your child will survive <coughs> with all of this what happens is that families automatically become smaller i think in all of our families we can anecdotally look back and recall the time when our pa- my parents were each one of eight children i am one of three and the third was an accident as we always tease her and none of us has had uh, more children than that the net result i had twins and stopped uh, my one of my sisters had had two uh, and the third one also had three the accident had another accident these things happen but no one went beyond that uh, not because they couldn't afford it but because they saw no need to uh and the generation below that might even end up uh with one it's simply a pattern we've seen in society after society around the world the problem in india has been that we have not been able to impart adequate health care to guarantee the survival of the child adequate education to guarantee the prospects of the child for future earnings and because we the government and the system have failed in health and education and as i said in my speech the new government is not giving enough emphasis to these things the result is that children are still being born but invariably you will find that with development family size reduces with women's education and the empowerment of women the woman has more agency and can actually resist having more children or space out the children she does have in every respect the old line that development is the best contraceptive is actually true now i agree with you that's a very long term answer but in a democracy how do you do a short term answer the chinese are not a democracy therefore they were draconian they ruthlessly imposed a one child policy and they're paying a terrible price for it today three consequences have already been reported there is the phenomenon of one person trying to support four aging grandparents on one person's income well he has a family of his own to support because there's nobody else he's it second there is the phenomenon of the hungry male because so many chinese parents aborted their um, female fetuses that there is an imbalance in many parts of the country and there are men essentially on the rampage looking for women there have been lots of cases of kidnappings assaults abductions and so on and third paradoxically there is the um, there is the uh, phenomenon of the unidentifiable woman because some children couldn't bear the idea of killing their baby their female baby so they didn't reveal that the baby had been born they didn't register the baby the baby was brought up in secret therefore couldn't go to school couldn't get a proper education has no prospects there not that many of them but there are some and this lot of women is again becoming a socio economic challenge in china so you've got three kinds of severe challenges that we have been spared because the one time that this was tried during sanjay gandhi's a uh, dominance in the emergency there was such a backlash and rightly so that uh, no such action was ever contemplated again uh, so in a democracy i think advocating active intervention to curb family size will not work it will be a vote, vote loser and at the same time if we get development right then i think we will be able 
to, to change family sizes over time. Uh, no, sorry, uh, sorry, we have to, we have to uh, bring the proceedings to a close. Uh, much that we would have uh, loved to continue, but uh, there's the t time constraint. I'm sure all of you, ladies and gentlemen, would appreciate that. Uh, I thought the question-answer session was very good, and uh, Shashi, his analytical skills are absolutely brilliant. So I think the answers were very pertinent and uh, quite informative. Uh, a thank you to everyone, specifically the GIS Group, The Telegraph, Bandhan Bank, GS Marketing, Anderson Printing, Pernod Ricard, our sponsors for making this program uh, happen. Thank you very much. May I now request uh, Mr. Simipreet Singh, Director of GIS Group, to kindly present a memento to Dr. Shashi Tharoor, as a token of our appreciation of his presence at the chamber and for the second series of uh, the leadership talk. May I, may I uh, now request Mr. Siddharth Roy. Uh, is Mr. Roy around? The past chairman of our marketing and brand committee of the chamber to appropriately say thank you to Dr. Tharoor. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, please do join us upstairs at the Bengal Lounge. Thank you and good afternoon. Do join us upstairs at the Bengal Lounge. <laughs>